let's talk about the solution process. What happens when something dissolves in water? When you put, uh, when when some when you make a solution, okay. Basically, what happens there is the particles of your solute, the ions or the molecules that make up your solute, are dispersed in your solvent, and uh, that dispersal, okay, leads to the formation of the solution. So. What happens there is, if this is your solute particle in water, for example, it will be surrounded by water molecules, okay? These are water molecules. So that process is called solvation. And if the water, mo if the solvent happens to be water molecules, you can also say that that process is called hydration. Now, um, if you have an ionic compound and that dissolves in water, okay, the ions will all be dispersed and be individually hydrated. In other words, you're not going to see calcium and nitrate ions all together being surrounded by water molecules. So these are water molecules, okay? That's not what's going to happen, okay? What's going to happen is each calcium ion will be surrounded by water molecules. So if I have a calcium ion here, it's going to be surrounded by water molecules. So the calcium is separately hydrated from each nitrate ion. So your nitrate ion will be surrounded by water molecules as well. Okay. So uh, you can talk about concentrations of individual ions in solution. So, for example, if you have calcium nitrate that is 0.2 molar, okay, if you have a calcium nitrate solution that's 0.2 molar, what happens is that will give you your calcium nitrate, okay, if you put it in water, it will split up into calcium ions and nitrate ions. So, for every formula unit of calcium nitrate that you have, you're going to get one formula unit of calcium and two formula units of nitrate. So, if, so uh, this notation right here, where you put a, sim, a bracket around the symbol for the ion, like, okay, if I put a bracket around the symbol for calcium, that's the concentration of just the calcium ion. Okay? So, what would be the concentration of calcium ions in my solution here? If it's 0.2 molar calcium nitrate, then I'm going to say it's 0.2 moles of calcium nitrate that I dissolve in my water per liter, right? But if I'm only interested in the calcium, I'm going to say then, then that's, I have to multiply that by one mole of calcium ion per mole of calcium nitrate. Okay? Because a mole of calcium nitrate will give me a mole of calcium ions. So the concentration of my calcium ions will be what? 0 0.2 moles per liter. What would be the concentration of my nitrate ions? Then I'm going to say it's 0 0.20 mole. Uh, I have 0.2 moles of calcium nitrate. But each of these calcium nitrates is going to give me two nitrate ions. So I multiply that by two moles of nitrate. This is per liter. Two moles of nitrate for one mole of calcium nitrate. That cancels that. And so what's the concentration of nitrate ions? 0.2 times 2 is 0.4 moles per liter. Okay. So essentially what are we doing? We're just multiplying okay, the concentration of, of the salt of your solute by the coefficient of that ion in your compound. Okay? What would be the concentration of calcium nitrate itself? Then it's going to be zero. Okay? Because you're not going to get any grouping of calcium nitrate in solution that's going to be surrounded by water molecules. Okay, so if you have an ionic compound, okay, dissolves in water, okay, when you put, when you write this notation right here, when you put square brackets around the symbol, okay, uh, that means the concentration of that particular species. You're not going to get any species in solution that in, that has calcium and two nitrates attached to it, 
because when you dissolve that in water, those are going to spread out. Okay. So here's a clicker question. Assume you have a one liter solution containing 0.1 mole sodium chloride and 0.2 moles of sodium sulfate. What's the concentration of sodium ions in this solution? Is it 0 0.3, 0 0.4, or 0.5? Here's a hint. Your sodium chloride, what does it do in water? It gives you sodium ions and chloride ions. What does sodium sulfate do in water? It splits up into two sodium ions and a sulfate ion. So that means you're going to get two moles of sodium for every mole of sodium sulfate, and you're going to get a mole of sodium for every mole of sodium chloride. So what would be the concentration of sodium ions in your solution? Is it 0 0.3, 0 0.4, or 0.5? You ready? C is a popular answer. Let's see if that's the case. All right, so we're going to say then the sodium, concentration of sodium would be equal to moles of sodium from NaCl, right? Plus moles of sodium from sodium sulfate. Divided by the total volume in liters, right? So, liters of solution. So, you're going to say then here that it is 1. Sodium chloride is 0.1, right? So, it's 0.1 mole, 0.1, sorry, 0 0.10 mole of sodium chloride times how many moles sodium can you get from that? per liter, one mole of sodium per mole of sodium chloride, plus what come, how much did you get from sodium sulfate? Your sodium sulfate is 0.2. Okay. So uh, let me put my one liter down here in the denominator, one liter of solution plus 0 0.20 moles of sodium sulfate times how many moles sodium do you get? Two moles of sodium for one mole of sodium sulfate. So that cancels out, that cancels out. What would that give us? So that's 0.1 moles of sodium from sodium chloride plus point, what's 0.2 times 2? 0 0.40 moles divided by 1 liter. So that's 0 0.50 moles per liter. Okay? You should be do, able to do this in your head. You can just say 2 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.4 plus 1 times 0.1. That's a total of 0.5. The correct answer is C. Okay. Answer is C. Let's like take a look at this one. Which figure best represents the following solutions? Sodium chloride. Okay. Let's look at sodium chloride. Is it A, B, or C? Imagine the dot the this um circles is representing particles of your solid and then the gray shaded gray area is just water molecules okay the water so which of these a b or c best represent sodium chloride in water
So what does sodium chloride do in water? It gives you sodium and chloride ions, right? So they're not going to get stuck together in water, right? It's not A. Uh, so they're going to spread out. But is, is it going to be B or C? For every sodium you get, you're going to get a chloride, right? So if one of if one of these is sodium, the other is a chloride, right? So you must have equal amounts. Do we have equal amounts in B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Equal amounts. So B is good. How about C? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight unfilled circles, and you have one, two, three, four filled circles. So that's a two is to one ratio, right? This is a one is to one ratio. So the answer is B. Okay. Very good. So which one would be best represent the would best represent calcium chloride? C is uh, in figure C. Okay, so it's two is to one, right? Because calcium chloride will give you a calcium ion and two chloride ions. But uh, which one is calcium? Which one is chloride? Here, the filled circle. You have more of the filled circle, so this must be chloride, right? And you have less of the, I have more of the unfilled circle, I'm sorry. That would be your chloride. You have less of your filled circle. That would be your calcium. How about potassium nitrate? Which of these figures would best represent potassium nitrate? What does potassium nitrate do in water? Gives you potassium and nitrate. It's going to give you a one is to one ratio of ions. So which one? B. Except that we're representing the nitrate by just one circle. Okay. So you might argue that none is, would be none of the above. But if I have, if you have to pick one, then your best answer would be B, because that's a one to one ratio of ions. Okay. All right. What about molecular solutes? Uh, so if you have a molecular compound, um, most molecular compounds will not dissociate in water. They will not separate in water. They'll just remain intact. The molecule will be surrounded by water molecules. There are exceptions. The most common exceptions that you'll encounter are, are, are known as acids and bases. So strong acids in particular, uh, the only molecular compounds that are completely ionized when you put them in water are the six strong acids. So HCl, okay, if you put it in water, hydro hydrogen chloride is a gas made up of molecules, but if you put it in water, it will break up into H plus and chloride ions. So one, one thing all of these have in common is they break up into H plus and something else. Okay, so these are molecular acids. So this particular group of acids, these six, these six acids are what we call strong acids. They're essentially 100% ionized in water. So if you have HCl, you're not going to get any HCl molecules in water. Okay. If you put HCl molecule in water, it's going to split up right away into H plus and chloride. What actually happens is your H plus is going to attach itself to a water molecule. So if you have an H plus from the HCl, that would give you what's called a hydronium ion. But uh, so that's generally just written as H plus aqueous, okay? So if you have a 0.5 molar solution of HCl, okay, then that 0.5, you're going to lose all of that 0.5 moles of HCl. You're going to get 0.5 moles per liter of H plus and 0.5 moles per liter of chloride. And the HCl itself, you have pretty much none left, okay? So if you put HCl in water, all of that HCl is going to be gone. It's going to split up into H plus and chloride ions. So if I were to ask you, what's the concentration of HCl? Okay, what's the concentration of HCl molecules in a one molar HCl solution? Then you say it's going to be zero because it's not going to be there anymore. Okay, 
So when you use brackets around symbols, we usually write those around symbols for molecules or ions that are in solution. Okay. Um, if you have um, the formula of a salt, for example, uh, a cluster of ions, generally those concentrations are going to be zero. Okay. Weak acids and bases are molecular solids that were, are slightly ionized. Okay, they're slightly ionized. That means at any given instant, only a very small fraction of these molecules are dissociated, are broken up in water. So, for example, HNO2 is an example of a weak acid. Okay, so this is 0.5 molar HNO2. If you have a 0.5 molar solution of HNO2, part of it at any given instant, a very small part of it will be broken up into H plus and NO2 minus. But these amounts are trace amounts, okay? There's small amounts. Your HNO2 molecules, the concentration of your HNO2 molecule will still be pretty much 0.5 moles per liter. Okay, so HNO2 is what we would call a weak acid. So what's the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid? Strong acid is 100% ionized. At any given instant, if you can take a snapshot of your solution, there are no acid molecules, hardly any acid molecules there. They're all broken up into ions. Okay? And how do we know if an acid is strong or weak? We just have to memorize the six strong ones. All the other acids are weak. Okay? So those are six that you have to memorize. Now, most other molecular compounds, like I said, besides the strong acids, are part weakly ionized. Okay? So weak acid, most other... Com molecular compounds are generally not ionized, but they're weak, like I said, acids and bases, they're partially ionized. And the reason for that is because they actually react with water molecules, okay? So the H, this, like I said, this H plus actually attaches itself to a water molecule. So in fact, the better way to represent this reaction is to say your HNO2 will interact with a water molecule, give you H3O plus, this is what we call H plus aqueous, okay, plus NO2 minus. And usually when we represent these ionization reactions, if it's partially ionized, we use a double-headed arrow, okay, one going forward and one going reverse to indicate that we're dealing with a weak acid. Okay, so here's a clicker question. If you have a 0.5 molar acetic acid solution, which of the following species has a concentration closest to 0.5 moles per liter? Is it H plus? Is it acetate? Or is it HC2H3O2 acetic acid? So the thing you have to look, think about is, is acetic acid a strong acid or a weak acid? Is it strong or weak? Weak? How do you know it's weak? It's not one of the six, okay? So if it's a weak acid, which of these will have a concentration closest to 0.5 moles per liter? What you're going to have here is HC2H3O2. It's going to ionize in water. It's going to be mostly acetic acid, okay? Only a very small fraction of these molecules will be broken up in water. Acetic acid is a weak acid. Uh, basis, and the only one that you'll commonly encounter in freshman chemistry is ammonia, okay? Molecular compounds that can react with water to give you hydroxide ions are called bases. So NH3 plus water, what it actually does is you have NH3. This is the structure of ammonia. It's got a lone pair. So if it sees a water molecule nearby, okay, it can attract the hydrogen. So an H plus from a water molecule can jump to the ammonia molecule. And it will give you ammonium ion. And then that, what's left behind? That's your hydroxide ion. Okay. Now, at any given in so we say ammonia, the ammonia molecule has a tendency to ionize in water. It has a tendency to pull a proton. H plus is a proton, okay? 
it's just hydrogen with no electron, so it's just a proton. So it has a tendency to pull a proton from a water molecule to form ammonium ion and hydroxide ion. Note the main differences in the name here. This is ammonium ion. This is ammonia molecule. NH3 is ammonia. NH4 plus is ammonia. So because of this, ammonia, we say, is a base. But this extent of, you notice I'm drawing here to, to a double-headed arrow. What does that double-headed arrow indicate? It's only partially ionized. At any given instant, only a very small fraction of the ammonia molecules have actually done it. Now, this is a reversible process. Your protons can actually hop from one molecule to another in water. So it's not going to be the same ammonia molecules that, are, uh, that have picked up protons in water at any given instant, okay? So if you imagine gazillions of these ammonia molecules and water molecules, you can imagine H plus hopping from one molecule to another to give you, at any given instant, only a small fraction of those ammonia molecules have picked up a proton to become ammonium ions. So your ammonium ion concentration would be, and hydroxide will be negligible because this is a, ammonia is a weak base, but there's a certain amount of them that are formed and so if you have a 0.1 molar solution of ammonia, it will still essentially be 0.1 molar in terms of the concentration of the molecules themselves, okay? So let's take a look at this question right here. Which of the following has a higher total concentration of solid particles? 0.1 molar HCl or 0.1 molar H? Higher concentration of solid particles. HCl. Why HCl? Because what happens to HCl in water? It's a strong acid. It's completely ionized. So you're going to get 0.1 moles per liter of H plus and 0.1 moles of chloride. How much HCl would you have left? Hardly any. So the total would be approximately 0.2, right? Moles per liter. What about HF? HF also ionizes in water, but it is a weak acid. So if I have 0.1 molar of HF, it's a weak acid, so what's my con what would be my concentration? This will be approximately 0.1, and what would these amounts be? Trace amounts, small amounts. So it, what, would, what would be the total concentration of solid particles here? It's approximately 0.1. Okay, so it's, the correct answer then is H, HCl would have a higher concentration of solid particles. For which of these is the concentration of solute molecules closest to 0.2 moles per liter? 0.2 moles molar HNO3. Okay, is this a strong or weak acid? Yeah. HNO3 is one of the six strong acids. 0.2 molar HF. HF is strong or weak? It's a weak acid. 0.2 molar NH3. NH3 is a weak base. 0.2 molar C6H12O6. Okay, that's a molecular compound, right? Glucose. So that's not going to dissociate. It's going to stay as molecules. And then NaCl. What does NaCl do in water? Completely ionized, breaks up into sodium and chloride ions, right? So which of these will give you a, a solution where the total concentration of solute molecules is closest to 0.2 moles per liter. Note, all of these solutions are 0.2 molar. Which one do you think?
see how we're doing. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, okay, strong acid. What do we know about HNO3? It's a strong acid. It's going to give you H plus plus nitrate, right? So all that 0.2 moles per liter of HNO3 is going to be gone, right? How much H plus will you get? 0.2. How much nitrate would you get? What's the total? Okay. Uh, now, do you? What's the concentration of molecules, solid molecules here? Are these molecules? H plus and nitrate are ions, right? So what's the total concentration of solid molecules in HNO3? Close to zero. So it's not A. Okay. Uh, what about, uh, let's try, let's look at E. What happens to sodium chloride? It gives you ions. Does it give you any molecules? No molecules there either. Zero molecules. Okay. So what about B, C, and D? H, F will give you H plus plus F minus. This is approximately 0.2, right? And this is going to be hardly any, right? Actually, there's a trace amounts here. So HF is a good answer. What about NH3? Same thing. NH3 would be about 0.2 because only, it's only going to be partially ionized. But what about glucose? This one is not even going to ionize and it's all molecules. So the best answer is glucose. And the one's the one that nobody picked. <laughs> okay, you have to review the, your, the ideas of ionic and molecular compounds from your earlier chemistry class, okay? You need to be able to recognize if a compound is ionic or molecular. C6H12O6 is a molecular compound. If you dissolve it in water, your molecules will be dispersed. Each molecule is going to be surrounded by water molecules. It's not going to ionize. The only molecular compounds that ionize in water are acids and bases. And it's easy to recognize the acids. They're usually written as hydrogen and something else. And the only weak molecular base that you really need to worry about is ammonia, NH3. Okay? Uh, it's the most common one you'll encounter. So what evidence do we have that solid particles do ionize in water or do break up into particles in water? Uh, one evidence is electrical conductivity. Pure water by itself, if you try to let water conduct electricity, it's a very, very poor conductor of electricity. Okay. So uh, if you put something in water that makes it conduct electricity that is evidence that whatever you put in the water is giving you ions in the water okay so if you have uh so if you have ionic compounds and strong acids you put them in water they make the water conduct electricity really well whereas most other molecular compounds if you put them in water they're not going to conduct electricity uh here's an animation that might uh, help you visualize that. Uh, you go to phet.colorado.edu. Okay. And do a search for, let's go look for chemistry animations here. Here's sugar and salt solutions. Okay. just so you can visualize what's going on when uh, something dissolves in water. Okay, so this is what happens. Here's, here's the conductivity probe. I put it in water, it, the light, it doesn't light up. What happens if I shake some salt in my water? The bulb lights up. 
the salt allows your gives you a solution that conducts electricity and so if i remove the salt it's there now if you look at it from a microscopic point of view okay what's happening when i shake my salt in my water see your sodium and your chloride ions are going to spread out and evenly disperse in the water okay and if you want to see what's going on there there see your ions are each ion is surrounded by water molecules we say each ion is hydrated but what happens if I did that with uh, sugar? If I shake some sugar into my water, it's not going to make your water conduct electricity. You say sugar is a non-electrolyte. Sugar is sucrose, is C12H22O11. Okay, that's sucrose. And if you look at it from a microscopic point of view, from an atomic perspective, let's remove my solute here. I'm going to shake some sucrose into it. I'm going to shake some sucrose. And see, these molecules okay, are going to spread out, but they're not going to form ions. They're just going to stay in, remain, they remain intact. And so if you, you want to see how they're affected in water, that's going to, let's reset this one. That's your sugar molecule right there. That's sucrose. Okay. So if I put some sugar in there, what happens is the molecule remains intact. Doesn't bro doesn't break up in water. So it's just each molecule is surrounded by water molecules. You say it's individually hydrated. But isn't it different if you heat it? Same thing. Is it? Mm -hmm. That's basically how. Why when you put salt in water it disappears sort of disappears in the water you get sweet all over right mm -hmm. so your salt mo salt molecules are dis i mean your sugar molecules are dispersed throughout the water okay same thing with the ions the ions are dispersed throughout the water that's why when you stir salt in your water everything tastes salty it's not just one part of the water that's salty okay so that's it's, the solution process is really just a dispersal of the solute particles among your solvent particles. So are they all surrounded by water molecules? Okay, so that should help you visualize what's going on. Okay, now another evidence of ionization is what are things what, that we call colligative properties. We can use this to actually determine the total concentration of solute particles. So, for example, if we were you have a solution that had 0 0.001 moles of sodium chloride from colligative properties when we measure the colligative properties in the lab we'll actually we'll find that it will appear to have instead of 0 0.001 moles of solid particles it will appear to have 0 0.002 twice as many so if you only put in 0 0.001 moles of sodium chloride but your experiment tells you it seems to have 0 0.002 what does that tell you that's evidence that each one of those split up into two. So each sodium chloride gave, each pair of sodium chloride gave, gave you two particles in solution. So that's evidence of ion, that's another evidence of ionization. So that, that's what we're going to talk about next. Let's, this might be a good time to take a break.